was an, a called out assembly. Are you following me? So Jesus then takes a secular word. He's now going to give it a spiritual nuance to describe the movement that he's getting ready to create. So he says to Peter and to the apostles, he says first to Peter, he says, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, Peter. Verse 17, he says, you are blessed, Simon, son of John. You're always spouting off at the mouth. You're always sticking your foot in your mouth. But this time you got it right. It's not something you have deduced by human intellect or ingenuity. This is by divine revelation. God himself has revealed this unto you. You could not figure this out on your own. God has revealed this to you, that I'm the Christ, the anointed one of God. And he says, I say also to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. Now what is interesting here, when Jesus refers to Peter, when he says, thou art Peter, he uses one Greek word. Then when he says, and y'all, you should be called the rock. And then when he says, upon this rock, he uses a different Greek word. He uses two different Greek words. One to describe Peter as the rock, a different one to describe the rock upon which he was going to build the church. So the word that he uses for Peter, the rock, it refers to a stone. But when he refers to the rock on which he's going to build the church, it's a massive thing. It is a massive rock, a massive stone. So he says, you are Peter, you are a little stone, but it's upon this rock, it is the divine revelation that you have uttered, that I am the Christ. That's what the church is built on. The church is not built on a person. It's not built on an individual. The church is built on Christ. He is the rock. He is the foundation. It is a revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's what the church is built on, not on some human being, but on the divine messianic Christ. And that's what he's saying. Upon this rock, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. Now, no. He says, I will build. So when he makes the statement, what he's getting ready to do is in the future. I will build. Not I have built. Not I have established. I will build my church. Church, and now he introduced the term church in a totally different nuance. Now he used the term church, ecclesia. I'm going to build my ecclesia. I'm going to build those that I'm going to kaleo. I'm going to call. I'm going to call them out of the world's entanglements. I'm going to call them from under the world system and the world's way of thinking. I'm going to call them out of the world into a relationship with me and into a relationship with each other. And now the ecclesia, the assembly, becomes more than just a group of people coming together. It becomes a group of folk who have been divinely called out of darkness into the marvelous light to show forth the praises of the one who's called, who's been called out of sin into a lifestyle of holiness and righteousness. A group that's been called out of the confusion, chaotic way of operating in the world into a world system that is described by the love ethic to love your neighbor as you love yourself and to love each other who have been called with you as I've loved you. So Jesus now defines the word church in a total new light in the light of what he's getting ready to do. Are you following? So why do we need the church? We need the church because it helps to hold us in balance because of the diverse personalities and gifts that God places in the body, building into our lives, rubbing up against our lives, and reminding us who we are and helping us move to become what God would have us to be. We need the church because it is only the church that God promises will have a perpetual presence. He says, Thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, my ecclesia, and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. The gates of hell would not prevail against it. He didn't say the gates of hell would not prevail against an individual. He says the gates of hell will not prevail against my assembly, my called out ones. We need the church because the church provides for us a spiritual protection that we can't get anywhere else. 
it provides a spiritual protection because God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit has placed a spiritual shield around his ecclesia so that the very authorities of hell cannot overcome the church, cannot overthrow the church, but not only that, the authorities of hell cannot prevail against the church, the authorities of hell cannot prevent the church from moving forward. We need the church more than it needs us individually. We need, to be, we need to be a part of the assembly because it helps to hold us in balance. We need, to, we need to be a part of the assembly because it provides for us a spiritual protection that we don't have as an individual. We need the church. I've thought about this in, in recent days. And I've shared this with you before. That from the time I was 22 years of age, the local church outside of my family has been the whole focus of my life. I didn't start coming to church every Sunday when I got called preaching. I started going to church every Sunday when I gave my life to Christ in March the 5th, 1978 at Mount Calvary Missionary Baptist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee, up on the mountain overlooking downtown Knoxville. So the church became the focus of my life apart from my family. I love the church, the local assembly. And as I grow older, I begin to realize how much I need it and how much I've always needed it. Can I get some help? Let me just testify to tell you my own story about how God has used the church in my life when I didn't even know it. I've shared this story with you before. When I was nine years old, my heart was absolutely crushed when my oldest brother got killed, I did not want to live. And I contemplated suicide as a nine-year-old boy, but God used the church. A young preacher by the name of Braxton Brody at his first pastorate happened to be the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Mount Hope, and he spoke a good word into my life. A godly teacher by the name of Elise Watkins, whom I had in the fourth grade and the fifth grade and the sixth grade, only the providence of God would allow me to have the same school teacher as I had a Sunday school teacher. And every single day, she spoke a good word into my life, and she encouraged me every single day and gave me hope and a reason to move on. God sent a man to pastor the First Baptist Church of Mount Hope, West Virginia, the most godly, the kindest man I've ever known in my entire life, Reverend James Thompson. If he wasn't a uh, Jeremiah, I don't know who was, and he wept over us boys, and he would watch us play out in the street, and he would come and supervise our play together, and he encouraged us, and he pulled us up in the Sunday school class and tried to turn us into a choir, and we couldn't carry a note in a bucket. <laughs> and he adopted his nephew and brought him into his house, and his nephew was the same age as me, and he would invite us into his house for dinner. He would take us over to the the, the McDonald Hill on the bypass. We didn't have no McDonald's or, or Burger King. We just had one little shop called Burger Land, only place you could go and get a hot dog or ice cream cone. And Reverend Thompson would take us over to Burger Land and take the little meager income the First Baptist Church was paying him and buy us not, uh, raggedy clothes, nappy heads, snotty nose boys, something that made us feel like something. It was the church. It was the church. And when I was just coming into my teen years and marijuana was hitting the street and some of my friends were starting to drink, there was an old guy in the neighborhood had been the principal at Dubois Elementary School. He was now principal down in Beardsport, but he still lived in Mount Hope. His name was Thomas E. Ash, Jr. And Mr. Ash didn't take nothing from nobody. And when you graduated into Ash's class, the senior class, you did it with fear and trepidation. And I was 15 years old, and Thomas E. Ash grabbed me, and he says, you can't play on the church basketball team because you play on the high school basketball team, but you going to coach the team. He didn't say, are you going to, will you coach it? I want you to coach it. He said, you going to coach it. And so when my friends made a departure for me, and I remember the day, I remember the night when my best friends experimented with marijuana for the first time. The only reason I didn't, because I was with Thomas E. Ash in Hilltop at the Baptist Temple, coaching a bunch of elementary school kids. It was the church. It was the church. 
It was a church in that neighborhood in the community. I can remember my friends. I used to go fishing with them every Saturday. We would get on their daddy's truck.